Hello and welcome back. Season 2 is here. Thanks for joining us for another episode. I am Malcolm Childs. And I am James Skiffins. And we are Just Making Conversation. Where we discuss the ins and outs of the model making hobby that brings us joy and pain in equal measure. From the greasy sprues to the gloss coats and everything in between, we are just going to make conversation. Remember, there are other podcasts you can listen to Plastic Model Mojo, The Scow Model Podcast, Plastic Posse Podcast, On the Bench, Model Geeks, The Sprue Cutters Union, Small Subjects, Built Sideways. Head to modelpodcast.com for all the links. If you've enjoyed our podcast, consider leaving a review or five stars as it promotes this podcast for more people to enjoy. Showing your support to us is easy as making a coffee. In fact, why not go over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash JMC podcast and do just that. Your support will go towards making the podcast and the content just that little bit better. In this episode, we'll just be making conversation about modelling for beginners. Just what is the best route into the hobby? And are we doing enough to encourage the next generation of master modellers? Starting a new hobby can be overwhelming. Not knowing quite what's needed or where to start. So much advice and shiny things to buy, it just becomes too much to process. No one wants to be the person with all the kit and no idea, right? When starting anything new, the first thing you want to do is leap in feet first. As with most hobbies, being engulfed in all the things all at once would likely give you a bad experience. So what's the best way to ease a newbie into the hobby? So there was something you wanted to talk to me about today. There was something you wanted to discuss that was something to do with stashes and caches. Would you like to explain? Yes, I would. It's come up in conversation a few times with our listeners about another podcast that unfortunately is no more. used to do a section called Stash or Cash. So the premise is the listeners of that podcast would write in and give a few examples of things in their stashes that they didn't know whether they should keep or not. And the hosts give their opinions as to whether they would sell it or whether they would keep it in their stash. Also within that section, they they themselves would pick out a few models from their own stash. Speaking to the gentleman, if you'd like to say, from... Scale Model Shed. Scale Model Shed, it was what it was. There was Ivan. It was Graham. And Dan. I spoke to all three, and they're happy for us to use that segment. But we're not quite sure how we're going to twist it into our own fashion or something. So, <laughs> well, well, we're, we're going to f- get up. That's probably what we're going to end up doing. <laughs> <laughs> this is pre-warning. <laughs> alert, alert. <laughs> pre-warning. <laughs> pre-warning. In a couple of podcast times, so in about a month's time or so, we're going to do stashes, blah, 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 and that's going to kick off our stash or not to stash section, if you like. Stash or not to stash. Have we got, have we got a name for it yet? Well, we've used three already, so it'll be one of the three. <laughs> so stash or cash to stash or not to stash or not to cash. Oh, it could be cash your stash you know what there's a month to go <laughs> listeners call to action get your topics in for your stash or cash or stash or not to stash or must cash must stash must mustache must cash mustache cash <laughs> <laughs> think of it a snazzy little um title for this particular section then you can throw that in with your topics in which you want us to discuss it's a nod to the the three gentlemen that that sparked our interest in doing our own podcast so mm-hmm. yeah thanks to you guys thanks guys we'll, we'll give it a go stash or cash stuff in your stash do you want to stash it still or should you cash it in runs off the tongue so easily Absolutely. I'm so glad we scripted that bit. That was handy. While while we're totally off script per se, can I just remind you that we are two weeks into the Walnut Challenge group build. We need a a jingle for that. Over to you, James. Walnut Challenge group build! Yeah, that's... Certainly going to get people's attention. 
That's amazing. Doesn't even that didn't even sound like you. Where did you get that voice from? <laughs> Out of the drawer. Well, made with walnuts too. <laughs> so clever. You're a genius. Just I happen to have my nuts in my hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, walnut build. Right, I'm going to show you something that is part of my walnut build. I'm so glad this podcast is on telly. I'm <laughs> going to take a picture. Of it. <laughs> I'm going to show you something that's. I'm going to flash it up at you, and I want to hear your reaction to what I'm going to show you. And this is the start of my walnut build. Oh, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Right, you're listening, people. I'm going to show him something. No, no. Oh my god! Hang on a minute. Is this in total, complete and utter, just making conversation style of? I don't do electrics. Don't understand them. What a waste of time! I buy stuff. I just look at it and think I wasted my money. What? I just showed James a little battery pack and a little LED that I've got on the end of it. I decided after our last podcast that perhaps I was being a bit uh, lazy when it came to electronics. So I got my ass in gear and I looked it up properly and I found out how to do these things and I had to find out how to use these little connector things that I had. I don't have to do any soldering. I just put the wires... No, it's all on connectors. Well, they're not kind of connectors. They're things that you put the wires in, heat it up with something that causes heat like a lighter or soldering iron or something so i got something that does that and then uh, they just squeeze on they just tighten up and then it makes a nice connection and all i need to do is turn that switch it's on the bloody thing and it makes a light that's it i was amazed at how easy that actually was it's not as complicated as i thought it was so everything i said in electronics is bull- it's actually very easy once you put your mind to it. There we go. I am going to try and put an LED in a walnut. Wow. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I that's, have to say, that's blown me away. Good. A real reaction. That's that's my plan. My my uh, walnut build is going to have an LED in it. That's all I'm going to say for now. Wow. What about you? What revelation are you going to show me? I'm feeling underwhelmed because um, my smoke uh, machine hasn't arrived yet for my walnut. <laughs> You imagine that, open it up, and the smoke comes out of the order. <laughs> you can get vape machines and things, can't you? So I'm, I'm sure you could, by pressing a switch or something. For those of you that are clever enough to figure it out, it needs to. You know, It's it's, a, it's an atomizer, isn't it? Yeah, it's just an atomizer. It's, it's just something in which would be ever so easy, and I know that people throughout the community would be very appreciative. So get it on the market now. You can get them from remote control tanks and cars and things that make smoke and, and, and steam engines and all that. Rubbish. You can certainly do it. So Rubbish? Sorry, did I say rubbish? I meant excellent <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, so why not get one for inside a walnut? Absolutely. Why not? Well, you certainly could get it in a base, couldn't you? Because then all, all you need is a tube. So you need a battery pack and... Well, yeah, that, obviously the stuff to run the, the thing inside the basic, but um, to get it into your nut, all you'd need is a tube. Have you thought about what you're going to do? No, is the honest answer. Been a busy week. Um, I have had moments of looking online for inspiration and I have seen an awful lot of inspiration. My nuts are here on my desk. They are at hand. Those are on a small percentage of what I've got. But I have been looking at a couple of 3D printable things to go inside my nuts. I have got I have got one idea, but I can't find the figure that I need for it. Okay. There's, yeah, there's a couple of good ideas. And also, I saw, um, I saw on the uh, Walnut Challenge group build page. That's where you want to be heading if you want to get involved in this walnut business. We're trying to make a little group build just for anybody who wants to join. Get yourself a walnut, build something inside it. The walnut has to close, take some photographs of it and share it on that Facebook page. It's all free. It's all for a bit of fun. One of one of the guys that are involved in the challenge, Clive, uh, he posted up a picture from Tasmin Randell. Mm. And this is a, a walnut that's hinged, <laughs> proper hinged with a proper metal hinge. And it is, in fact, um, a house. A house. So it has a, a cellar, a bedroom, a front room. It has the, the full money in it, and it's just really quite funny. Wow. House prices must be an issue in where Clive lives. This is from the fairies at the bottom of his garden. Oh, so um, it would be small, obviously. Uh, but in this picture, you've got a um, one that's got uh, like a little larder, which has got some carrots and acorns in it. And Oh, how sweet. Yeah. Okay. It's really quite cool. Uh, again, if you do a bit of Googling, we aren't the only nuts that have done this. Uh, there are quite a few people out there. Oh, yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. 
Yeah. The problem is each time I look for something, I find something that makes me go, oh, and my brain goes off on a different tangent. So, yeah, I've got a couple of ideas. Okay. I've got a couple of ideas. Cool. Well, um, by next podcast, let's have yourself an idea. I think because I've got so many walnuts, I, I won't stick with one. I will, you know, once I've done one, I'll do another one. There's, there's no limit. No. Well, I, I plan this week to, to clean the nuts out properly mm-hmm. inside. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got my bases 100% right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one idea that you are aware of anyway, um, I'm going to start trying to manipulate the nut so I can get the, the basics right Yeah. Um, in the vain hope that I'll find the figure I need. Okay. I've certainly got plenty of nuts to fill. You're not willing to release the contents of your nuts currently? I've got one I'm satisfied enough to discuss because obviously the two parts need to close together. Yes, they do. Very important rule. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and cut <laughs> away um, in the front a little section which will become some steps into the nut because inside the nut will be sitting Darth Vader. Oh, yes in star wars or was it next generation i can't remember anyway star wars star wars in in star wars he has a, a regeneration pod so i'm going to try and recreate that but trying to find the darth vader figure is it, the bit that's giving my nuts a bit of a problem well at so that scale it could be anything it could be any person with a bald head that you paint gray i can't get in that nut any person well i tell you the other thing that popped into my head literally just now is that the, the walnut shape is um similar to the spaceship in Flight of the Navigator. It is, yeah. I might do something like that. Compliance. Oh, that's going to be a really good idea. Natural metal finish. Oh, yeah, natural metal finish, but also the autopilot in Flight of the Navigator is like a little round dot, isn't it? Yeah, he's like a he's like an eye, isn't he, on a on an arm. Yeah, I could I can fashion that quite easily. So I could actually do Flight of the Navigator with a little step down <gasps> where he's peering oh, down. Do you remember in the film? Yes, I do. Little green base. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to have it so that you can close it and open it a little bit. Just to... Well, no, don't need to. I don't have to open it. It has to close. It doesn't say it has to open. Oh, no, it's true. But does he pop his head out without opening then? In the film, when the main character was near the spaceship, yeah, the little man put his eye outside of the spaceship down the stairs. Uh-huh. Which was at the back of the spaceship. He had a little stairs come down, and then he literally peers out the door and goes, "Don't be long," or whatever it is he says. I can't remember exactly. Oh, is he? T- he's taking a piss, isn't he? Yes, that's him. Wow, that 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 just some neurons got fired then that just hadn't been fired for many many years. I felt that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant idea! Let's not tell anyone though. <coughs> so yeah. No, I keep that's keep that between ourselves. Um, but yeah, there's loads of little things like that. I also um, are you serious? Do you want me to cut that out? No, no, no. Leave, leave it in. If I leave it in, then everyone will know. If I if we keep it to ourselves, then I'll have to cut it out. Yeah, but no one listens anyway, Malcolm. It's fine. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so I've had loads of ideas like that. But I've also, being the person I am, I have read the rules very carefully. There is the ability to go around the rules. Good, good. Well, that's that's absolutely fine. Because like you are already doing that because you're not even opening your walnut with your flight of the navigator diorama. You're you're keeping the thing closed so it doesn't ever have to open because it's already closed. Yeah, I've got a couple of those sort of ideas. The other ones are going to keep under wraps for now. But yeah, I've got loads of little. Oh, I just I just had another one. Ooh, I really love your flight of the navigator idea. I can't not wait to see uh, who's going to steal that idea. Yes. <laughs> Might need an LED in it though. That's the only downside. That doesn't need an LED in it. No, it just needs to be very, very shiny. You spray it very, very shiny. Make your steps. Make your grass space. You can probably print a flight of the navigator. Navigator. No, the boy was navigator, wasn't it? The flight of the navigator pilot. Weird, isn't it? In the film, you think the flight of the navigator pilot would need a pilot rather than a navigator because if he can't navigate. Why is he flying the thing? Or, or was he the navigator and the young boy was the pilot? No, the boy was the navigator because he had all the information in his head. Do you remember? Ah, uh, okay. Ah, uh, yeah. It's just a little time ago since I watched it. Anyway, we're, we're going to get to our proper topic in a minute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good Lord. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, keep, keep tuned in. Keep us abreast of your progress with your nuts. I'm not sure if those two words should be in the same sentence, but never mind. I've done it now.
So the topic for today, Malcolm. Yeah, getting new modelers interested in the hobby and how to help a modeler into the hobby without scaring them off for good. So what do you think the best way for a new model maker would be to enter into the hobby? I think that people would start the hobby either by being bought a small kit by the parents and then they they kick off, you know, as a child. If we stick with um, getting adults into the hobby, shall we? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's because that might just just for this one, because I think the two conversations are different for children and adults. What do you think? They are. So let's talk about getting adults into the hobby. You know, say you've got a non modeling friend. How would you get them into the hobby? And I think the first thing it comes down to is what they're going to build. Mm-hmm. So they have to have an interest in something else other than model making to make an avenue for them to get into model making. So I would say if they were interested in Spitfires, if they were interested in armor if they were interested in buildings if they're interested in anything that you can make a model of that is your hook and your stairway to getting them interested in that in our hobby i would say Mm. they'll want to build that thing to have that thing on their shelf a representation of that thing and they'll probably say oh dude i know you're a model maker would you make me the model of the thing that i served in would you make me the model of my house or whatever now, of course, obviously it takes some skill and time and everything else, but you could certainly help them in on, on the way, you know. Um, you, can, you could help them getting a, uh, a kit together. You could help them building it. You could help them put it together. You could help them by getting them a, just a little kit to start with to kick off rather than going straight to the, to the main event immediately. I think that is a very dangerous thing. Look, we said in the intro, often when, a, when someone's getting into the hobby for the first time, the first thing they want to do this is the biggest, baddest, most parts, most plastic, hardest model known to known to human beings. Most expensive thing in the shop. Uh, it must be really hard for um, <laughs> hobby shop owners to say, "Oh, hang on, you're new to the hobby. I don't think you should be buying the most expensive thing." If I said I want to go learn skiing, and you said, "Here you go. Here's a black run. Go for it." Yeah, I want to learn how to swim. All right, jump off that bridge into that river. Yeah, if you come back up, you're managing it. There's lots of hobby like that. If you jump in at the deep end, I'm not saying that you're going to die. <laughs> I'm just saying that it would be a bad idea to start any hobby from the mm. deep end, including uh, model making. You know, you have to build up your uh, knowledge of tools. You have to build up your knowledge of what the paints do. You have to build up your knowledge of what the glues do, how it all reacts with the plastic you've got how to cut things off, how to deal with the frustration of dropping stuff, all that kind of thing has to be learnt, and you can't just do it off the off the bat. They go through two processes. They go through a little bit of um, hesitance as to start it because they're a little bit overwhelmed. Um, mm. And then obviously once they've started it, they'll get a little fr- frustrated. And during that time, you often find that people that have done that, gone into the hobby that way, spend like crazy. Right. They buy all sorts of stuff. Oh, I'm going to do that kit next. I'm going to get this kit next. And I'm going to do this. But they haven't started stroke finished the one kit they wanted to start with. Um, and they go off on ta- off tangents. And often you find that you end up with a shelf of doom real, real quick because you get to a certain point within the model and you're not quite sure it's, you're doing the right thing or you've made a mistake. So you go on to the next box. Quite often find they suffer from the, the squirrel syndrome. Squirrel. Really, really badly. So you can generally spot a new model maker pretty easy because they're constantly going, I bought this and I got this and I got that. Well, that happens to a lot of experienced models too. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm a, a tool whore myself. Been buying lots of different tools for many, many years. Still not settled on the right ones. Mm. I think that's something that uh, doesn't leave you maybe. But yeah, I know what you mean. Do you think they get frustrated with the model and then just move on to something else? I think it's a combination of things. I think, you know, certainly while they're building that first model that really shouldn't have been their first kit, there is an element of frustration and certainly a period where they're like, well, I'm definitely going to achieve it. I definitely am. They go off and buy other kits because they know that they're going to they're going to be so good at that first kit that they can go on to their interior one uh, sixteenth Tiger Tank, all singing, all dancing, kits and all whatever. And do you think they'd ever come back to them once they're sat on the shelf and they've given up and moved on to something else? It's very hard to pick up that old old kit and start it up again, isn't it? Well, I think from an experienced modeler's point of view, you know, once something hits that shelf of doom, it takes an awful lot of energy to take that 
kit off there off the shelf and, and actually do it. Mm-hmm. it so once you've left it you often don't return to it yeah. now there are different examples of that when you know when things like for example if you are doing a kit that has a very repetitive stage with lots and lots of different bits that you're putting together but basically you're repeating and repeating repeating or like for example you've gone down the mad road of putting fiber optics in your <laughs> static enterprise yeah you know there does come a point where it's like you know if i see another fiber optic going with a screen so those sort of times is when they go on the shelf and you don't and, and you go back to them but as a, a new modeler when you get frustrated because you've not achieved something or you've glued something together and then gone to put it in like for example you glue all the cockpit together and then decide to put it into the fuselage and it doesn't fit because you haven't done that test fit yeah uh, because there's on stage one it says remove this bit and you haven't i, I should imagine there's a lot of that and there's certainly if going looking through ebay and all that sort of thing there's lots of kits that have started and not finished or started really badly painted and not finished yeah the experienced bottler can get around these things you know the ones that, that are happy to spend 15 quid on a kit and then stick it into a chemical to remove all the paint and all that sort of stuff there are ways around it there are yeah but as a, as a newbie unfortunately it's pretty easy to get stuck in a moment of you know what, i really want to do that i'm going to buy that sort of yeah, thing and, it is, and, yeah. and then realize that that was the wrong move so with that in mind what what would be your suggestion so say for example i'm a new modeler uh and i'm very interested in let's say spitfires because you mentioned it earlier mm-hmm. um and you're my friend and you're like well you know what um you've asked me to build a spitfire but i'm not gonna build it yourself and I'm going to walk you through it. What, what would you? What would be your suggestion from that point on as to what I need to to uh, start my journey in terms of tools and paints and yeah, stuff? Yeah, just mm. generally um, kits, blah blah blah, that sort of thing. I I would say don't worry about painting it at all. For to start, just enjoy mm-hmm. the building part of it. Get it built. Don't worry about the cockpit. Just build it. You know, um, start with something that has a low amount of parts. Um understand how to take the parts off the sprue uh, and not leave any plastic leaving uh, laying there that's going to interrupt the build and, and the way the parts go together. Make sure you understand how to sand things down so the parts fit. I see it all the time. New modelers will cut stuff off the sprue and then wonder why they don't fit. It's because they've got massive lumps of plastic between the gaps. Uh-huh. I think it's just going to be like a jigsaw puzzle. you know. Uh-huh. Um, so that's that's very important. And Give them some good glue. Yeah, you don't want to give them glue that's going to dry up very quickly. You don't want to give them glue that's going to uh, bung up quickly either. You want something that's going to be good, like extra thin, for instance. Uh-huh. And once they've got that and they know how to use that, then they'll be a well away. You need to be spoilt, I guess, when it comes to uh, glues. Yeah, and then and then also show them what the instructions mean. The different things on instructions that say, like a question mark. Why does it have a question mark on that instruction there? What does that mean and what does that entail? Learning how to look ahead in your instructions to see what you need to decide on before you do it. Um, and also just do it step by step. So once you've got step one done, well done. Once you've got step one done and those instructions, you can sort of sit back and go, yeah, I put those bits together. Where's my medal? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Because you, you need that kind of um, satisfaction, <laughs> don't you? Yeah. With modeling, it, it takes a long time to finish something. And so you don't get that instant satisfaction. If you're doing other hobbies like archery, for instance, if you hit, if you hit the bloody target in, at all, that gives you some satisfaction. Right? If you get a bullseye, that's, that's super satisfaction, isn't it? That's what yeah. you want to do. But with model making, you don't really hit that <laughs> bullseye until you've done, you know, you're, you're super satisfied with it. Uh-huh. And that never really, that never really comes, does it? I think that's an important thing to 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 make sure people are aware of is that <coughs> model making itself is not an instant gratification. Uh, it is something that is mm. all about the journey. It's all about the experience of that journey, and understanding that that process is that is the way that leads you to grat- gratification. And yes, there are little bits of gratification as you go along. Like say, you finish section one, it all sticks together, and it sits how it should do um you know achieving that paint effect or putting the first coat of paint on 
in a way in which you're happy with first time around and all that sort of stuff. So, yep. but to get to those points, there's a journey to every single stage. So there is a journey to learn how to glue the plastic together to make sure you've sanded things together so they fit well. You know, getting your paint down properly if you're using an airbrush or a hairy stick, it doesn't matter. Uh, whichever method you use to apply it, there will be trials and tribulations with that. And not necessarily up to the point where you get it right, because there will be some after that as well, because you'll go, oh, I've done that really well. And then the next time you do it, you go, well, why did that go so bad? Mm. You know, because you because the environment in which, like, for example, an airbrush, and you, you sprayed it on the first day in a, in, a, in a mild sort of temperature sort of day, and the next time you sprayed something, it was really hot. Yes high humidity etc cetera, etc cetera. so learning all those facets are are all part of the journey but uh, yeah, tool wise yeah yeah, yeah tool wise i, I think say? i think basically with a kit any kit when you're starting out the best thing you need the first thing you need is a good pair of nippers that's a must i would suggest to you that if you're going to invest any money in any equipment at the beginning of your journey nippers is where you need to spend that money straight off the bat don't go for the cheap um one pound uh, side cutters you can buy in a, in a pound store or something yes they will work to a point but they're not going to be ideal Malcolm has got his I, hand up I use cheap nippers all the time I don't have expensive nippers I only use cheap ones mm-hmm. okay <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I got some here there we go these nippers where did you get them from and how much were they do you remember uh, these are about two quid each. You buy a pack of ten of them, uh, maybe by Plato. But, but I don't know if you can see the end of them. The ends are mm-hmm. not pointy. Yeah, they occasionally will get stuck together, so I have to push them out a bit. Mm-hmm. But they cut the job, and and I do always sand afterwards as well. Mm. So I guess you're talking about clippers that you don't have to sand afterwards, and also perhaps could probably get into smaller gaps than these ones. The nippers I'm talking about are. So right, Malcolm's showing me his, his nippers. We're gonna sh- gonna show each other the nippers. <laughs> These nippers here, um, they have a pointy end, uh-huh. but they have quite um quite a uh, a good grip on them, uh-huh. quite a fat, yeah. substantial grip on the arms. Yeah. Um, and they were cheap. They, I think that was uh maybe a fiver ish, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're not talking. We're not talking fast. I mean, I've got some other nippers in a drawer down there. That were thirty odd pounds. I seem to remember they were a horrendous amount of money. Blimey. Very good, but they're they're a lot of money. So, what I meant by the statement was, you can go into um, a pound store, dollar store, whatever, and buy yourself some wire nippers. Yeah, Trishan's nippers yes. for a quid. Yeah, tell you don't buy those because they're 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 rubbish. Right. Okay. The 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 experience of of tools isn't always down to the amount you spend without a doubt so you know if it's if it's you've got a choice of pair of nippers that are a pound pair of nippers that are five pound pair of nippers that are 35 pound it doesn't it doesn't equate that 35 pound will be all singing all dancing and never ever let you down because that's not true mm. and with tools um as with paint etc etc and glues and that you have to learn how to use them and how not to use them more importantly but yeah so i would just be careful cheap alternatives that are out there they are an alternative but they may not be what you need to use at the beginning Mm. because it will give you a negative experience and that's the key to it at the end of the day is to make sure the experience you have from the beginning of your journey is a positive one because your journey will be very short otherwise so what other tools do you need what other tools do you recommend for the beginner so really you only need a couple of other tools so I would just go with what's locally available to you. Don't worry too much about the ins and outs of it. Uh, don't go down the, the road of using super glue and all that sort of thing because it won't help you. Yeah. Get some proper glue that is used for, for model making. Yes. Uh, Temperate thin is good. Can dry a little bit quickly, but that's not too much of a problem, really. Oh, well, as long as you know how to use it. And the, the technique for using it isn't written on the side of the bottle, is it? No, it's not. It is very much a case of putting your two pieces together and allowing the, the glue to run into the joint. Whereas if you go for something like Revell Contact, which personally I, I quite like, especially the type with the little needle, because you have a little bit more control over it as to where you're putting it. You don't worry about that blocking up. How do you get it to not block? 
There is a, a method of, of unblocking it, and it's very easy. You just put a heat source on the needle uh, just for a very short period of time, and it, it heats up what's in the needle, and your glue's running again. Right. So it does block up for you. Do you leave yours laying down on its side, or do you leave it sticking up in the air? Sticking up in the air. Oh, it still blocks after that. Still blocks, yeah. Okay. Okay. You tend to find with the contact, what happens is, is that where you're using it, the glue can get onto the outside of the needle. Well, it's not really a needle, is it? It's just a very thin tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over a period of time of use, that glue on the outside will congeal and become solid, which your finger and thumb can pull pull that bit off. It's easy right. peasy. Make sure you clean the, clean the your end, so to speak, when, you, when yeah. you're finished, because that, that will help reduce that. But, yeah, there are times it does block, but I just find by literally I, – I, and you don't want to blow yourself up and hurt yourself. But if you click a lighter and you have your flame, put the needle into the blue part of the flame, which is right at the base, just for literally a second or two, and then take it back out. And you generally will find that the needle is heated enough for it to, to make anything that's inside that tube yeah. run yeah, yeah, properly. Yeah, yeah. And then you're then you're you're good to go pretty much all the way through the session of your model making without yes. that problem. It's when you leave it and allow it to um, you haven't used it for a bit. The other thing I would also point out is that they have a, a like a plastic tube that goes over the top for storage on the on the bigger ones. Anyone? Anyway, not quite sure on the smaller ones, um, but on the the larger size, be careful with that because obviously the glue will any remnants of the glue on top, on the end of your, your tube will be inside and that will create a little bit of dry glued in there and over time you can't seal it properly. Right. If if you were my friend and you were starting, they would be the two glues in which I suggest you would use. The contact glue, because it's it's easy and it's controllable with the, the little tube on, on, on the thing. If you were a brand new modeler, I probably would tell you to go for the, the Tamiya Thin anyway and explain to you yeah. by that yeah. because it's a much more satisfying... Okay adhesion i think i found the uh the white top the tamiya white top to be similar to the contact mm. in viscosity um so if you're doing something a, a much of wide area the white top and i think actually the white top tamiya is the cheapest glue yeah yet. probably because the revel one is not that cheap because you get two, two different sizes don't you 2.5 grams or 25 yeah. grams or something and then the, uh, a slightly larger one it all comes down to what you're comfortable with, I suppose. You know, we always come back to that, doesn't it? So, well, it doesn't matter really what it depends what you want. But to start with, I think it's important that you get something that is going to be reasonably easy to do because you're going to lose interest. Or your, be your beginner that you're trying to get interested in it is going to lose interest. And the caveat, as always, will be throughout your journey is that whatever you use, you'll have to learn how to use properly. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is very little in the modeling uh, hobby world in which you can literally pick up and just there you go you're off and I'm running yes yeah. it takes a little bit of finesse and understanding quite what can affect that product in which you're using some people some people some people recommend the metal files the little set of metal diamond files you can get Yep. As a starter, what do you think about that? Uh, funny enough, that's how I started. They're, oh. they're the sort I, I used to used to have. Mm -hmm. um, now, I wouldn't recommend them uh, as a starter because they're quite aggressive Yeah. in, in the fact they're metal. And there are lots of products out there, uh, sanding sticks in different grades and all that and the other, that you can pick up for next to nothing. Um, and literally fail safe or oh, fail safe not quite the right word a fallback position would be some sanding blocks that you would use in in doing your nails and that sort of thing yeah. in which you can find very cheaply a caveat to this is this would be one of those examples which i would say to you a pound shop is quite cool pick up things like that and they are inexpensive mm -hmm. so you can ruin them really quickly and it doesn't matter and you can certainly cut your teeth on them so to speak mm -hmm. and then once you're happy with that, you could then go to the numerous other companies and bits and pieces that have them that are a little bit more model specific. Now, the reason I say it like that is because you'll tend to find in the pack you get in the pound shop, they are one size, they're big, chunky, fat things, um, and they're not overly practical for your hobby. Mm. Whereas the ones you can buy specifically for your hobby, you've got sticks, you've got bits of cards you can cut up and make your own whatever mm -hmm. stuff. Um, yes, there are some some shortcuts and um, some cheaper options of making your own. 
but right now i wouldn't make your own i'd spend a little bit of money on on it is peanuts money wise for the sanding and then if you want to save some money in your journey a little bit further down the road you can look at scratch building your own dinny sticks and all that sort of stuff and there's plenty of information out there on the internet but don't do that right now and get get to grips with your model first oh i would agree with you a couple of different size grits a polishing stick that's it get someone to show you or go on youtube and find out or well, probably best to get someone to show you but show you how to get rid of those um lumps of plastic that you don't want where they should be all that sort of thing and how to sand stuff down i'm not talking about filling or anything like that at all uh i wouldn't be interested in teaching no. someone how to be f- filling a model up uh or gaps <laughs> at this stage you know just as the starters um no so yeah just to removing those seam lines and things like that i think is, is the key I've never used those diamond files before, but I know people do recommend them. I've never used one myself. Yeah, I, I certainly have them, um, and I've still got them. I do use them from time to time, um, but they are they are very aggressive. And the one thing that I always found quite frustrating with them was that, um, yeah, they get rid of the plastic. They carve through the plastic like bilio, yeah. depending on what kit you had. And in some occasions, they were so aggressive you didn't realise how aggressive they were being so for example you've got like a, a kit that's very soft plastic and you have other kits that are a little bit harder yeah, yeah. so i've done some filing with my metal files on on a hard hard plastic and and got a reasonably good result not brilliant but reasonable mm-hmm. and then i've applied the same method to a soft plastic not realizing there was a difference and suddenly realized that i i'm three millimeters into <laughs> the the aircraft seam that I didn't want to be into. Yeah. So now I'm looking at getting to have to filler and all that sort of stuff. Yes. So, um, yeah, they will be the, the go-to things I would get to start with. There are loads of other tools in which you will want, need, um, acquire throughout your, your journey. But those are the very, very basics in which you need to get up and running. Mm. Now, obviously with that said, I've agreed with Malcolm, that you were just going to make your kit you're not going to paint it you're not going to go down that road in any way so that is just literally put your models together once you get to the paint side of stuff mm-hmm. then you open up a whole different ball game yeah so you'll if you've got a start kit you'll have the little starter paints with them won't you you'll either have your revel your aqua color from revel yeah or your humble acrylics oh that's it yeah you'll have some basic you'll have some basic ones with you uh, for your starter kit now okay everyone's different <laughs> everyone has their opinions everyone either quite happy to use humbrol or not happy to use humbrol some people love the revel stuff some people loathe the revel stuff you know, as long as it all comes out to be a smooth paint finish at the end you're winning so for me if i was showing a a beginner how to paint their model i would i would want mm-hmm. to start them on airbrushing I would lend them my airbrush for starters and my compressor. I'll probably invite them around and say, this is how we do airbrushing. And I know that the the enjoyment they'll get from airbrushing something mm. will make them want to buy their own airbrush. Because once you've built a couple of models, we're not worried about the painting and everything. I think you're going to be really raring to go to kind of put, put some proper paint down. And so, yeah, that's what I would say. I would say, go and get yourself um, an airbrush and start airbrushing. Because that alone is an entire lifetime of practice experience requirements mm. forget the rest of the hobby part of it you know um put the building of plastic that's another thing but the, the airbrushing it takes years to master so just enjoy um, putting some paint down so the, the actual process of it's quite fun spraying down the colors and the only thing i would say would be a choice of paint wise should initially definitely initially be um down to what you've got locally what you can get your hands on locally yes you can buy it online you can do all of that it's ever so easy you just click and it posted to you blah blah but i would go and support your local hobby store or wherever you buy your bits from um and you've got a better potentially a better ability to snag what you need without worrying too much so for example if you're building a kit and you suddenly realize you've need a certain paint that you can go and get it and not have to wait for it to come in the post that makes sense yeah so say for example you bought your kit bought some paints that you thought you needed and then you suddenly realized you hadn't got uh, a black whatever to, to paint your tires or 
So go go with what's local, but if it's down the road and it's easy to get to, you can jump in the car or go for, go past it on the way home from work or whatever and pick it up. Right. So that that would be my advice. Yeah. Uh, the second reason for doing that as well would be that um, as modelers, there are I, I hear it all the time where someone's painting the model and going, oh, yeah, I can't finish painting it because I've run out of such and such. And I only buy it online. I only, you know, I've got to wait five days for it. Whereas if you, it was a product in which you could buy locally, source locally and easy to get to, you can go down the road and get another pot. Not a big problem. Right. I personally, I'm in two minds as to, to whether to say to someone, yeah, buy a starter kit that's got paint because they're invariably you tend to come to come across a problem with one of the paints at least within that blister pack and that can be very frustrating so that doesn't mean they're not usable because you you can use them but unfortunately for some strange reason when they everyone that i can think of where i've opened them up and used them i've always had at least one paint yeah i think people water them down as well they have a very wet brush and then they dip it into the paint which you know is a small amount of paint and then they get watered down very quickly if the, if the plastic's shiny it's just not going to cover I would also recommend someone primes their model as well. I was just about to say that. That that probably is where my experience has been, is that I've built a kit, opened up the brown on my Spitfire camo, started painting it on, and it looks like I've sneezed over it. It looks awful. <laughs> yes. And I think, to be honest, that's probably the key, is the fact that, remember, your shiny bit of plastic has got nothing for your paint to adhere to. Not everybody does. Let's face it. There's some people that do really good models that don't prime their work and they get good effects. So to make it easier for right now, buy yourself a primer. Um, I would suggest using a spray cam primer purely mm -hmm. because it's, again, it's easily sourced, easily available, and you haven't yep. got to worry about it too much. You don't have to buy it from a hobby shop either. No, exactly. It gives you the option to do the hairy stick or to do the uh, airbrushing. I agree with what you said if, is if my friend had talked about painting and I said to them, well, I use an airbrush. It's up to you. Do you want to do that? Do you want to come and I'll show you the basics with my airbrush and blah, blah, blah. Done it with a couple of friends already. Works really well. That can be, that can be quite an expense. Can be. Yeah. So I actually would say to someone, you've got a kit there, you've got paint there and you've got a brush. Use your brush. Right. It might not give you the best experience. But I would say to them, give it a go and just get some paint on there. Because let's face it, I can buy an airbrush. I, I, in fact, this happened to me. I bought an airbrush and I was like, I am going to be the master modeler now because I've got paint airbrush. Oh, that looked bloody awful. What did I do there? <laughs> you still got to learn the processes and how to, to let get the paint on there. Some paints are, you need um, a multitude of thin layers other paints you can almost flood the damn thing and it, and it works spot on every time don't, don't need to worry about it so you're going to have that experience with a hairy stick as well the reason i would say to someone use your hairy stick is because there are some elements of model making where you can't use your airbrush yeah most in fact most people can't use their airbrush i i, I change that slightly because there are some people that can get very very fine detail and they do everything with an airbrush cockpit dials for instance you can't there's a shed load of clever people out there, but I've never been that clever. So the reason I would, that would be the reason I would say to someone, use a brush. A, you've got it free. It's available. It's ready there for you to go. And secondly, you're going to have to learn how to use that brush at some point anyway. So why not do it now? Why not do it to start with? So you'll learn the, the ability to cover your Spitfire wings in a manner in which it'll be a thin coat, then a second coat, and it'll look amazing. Right. You can still get the same effects, your mottling and all that sort of stuff by using a paintbrush. It's it's difficult, but you can do it. And then you've got you've got a basics um, of painting knowledge with a with a hairy stick. Then, then it's a case of okay, I've, I've enjoyed this process. It's really really cool. I would then say to my friend, okay, you're looking like you're really enjoying this hobby. Get yourself an airbrush at some point when you can afford it. But don't buy the cheapest one you possibly can from china because that will again affect your your journey in, in a negative way buy a decent airbrush decent compressor but buy it with the knowledge that you are not going to switch that on and go look at that hey i'm amazing it will take you time to learn and there will be so many different things in which you'll have to learn to get to a basics with an airbrush yeah 
and then you've still got stuff to learn on top of that because you you then take into account you know you you get comfortable and you're all of a sudden you're now spraying in winter summer and god knows what and yeah all the different types of humidity there is etc 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 so um but that would be my that would be the key thing i'd say to my friend is that you know just bear in mind that this hobby is frustrating. You're going to learn stuff and you will forget stuff. With the airbrush then, so it's difficult. It's a lot of factors are involved with the airbrushing, like we said. But I think as long as the friend is, like you said, up for the fact that it's going to be tricky and is prepared for that, mm-hmm. then I think you're going to be okay. The hard thing is, is when someone, buy, like you said, buys the hairbrush and, and says, I'm going to be the best ever because I bought the most expensive one. Therefore, it's going to be easy. And then get very frustrated because it doesn't just mm. fall out of the, the airbrush. It doesn't just work straight out. As long as you're willing to buy that product, which could be, let's say, 50, 60, maybe 70 pounds, you get a, 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 two airbrushes maybe and a compressor and whatever. Um, as long as you realize that there is every possibility that those airbrushes will be thrown away mm. Um, because they are no good, or um, the compressor will be knackered within six months, or you know, as long as you're, you're, long as you're happy to, to to make that expense effectively to throw yeah. it away, then then do it. It will. It certainly will give you two things. It will give you the first few times you use it a really good spray, and you'll go, oh yeah, I love this. But then immediately it will give you the the annoying frustration that comes with owning an airbrush because it will clog up. Things will start going wrong with it. You, are, oh, you say, I'm doing the same thing I did last time, but it's not working. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. That's part of that journey that you'll get. You'll still get that with a more expensive branded product like um, a Badger airbrush, for example. However, you tend to find that with a... Um, with like a badger airbrush if something's going wrong it's probably down to two two things it's either you yes, you're doing yeah. something wrong or you haven't cleaned it properly those will be the main factors go for a cheaper airbrush you're then thrown into the fact the factor of poor construction yeah etc etc from buying a cheap product so if you can take that one factor away then you know it's down to I'm doing something wrong or I've not cleaned my airbrush because they are the only two things that will go wrong with a, a badger airbrush I'm with you. pretty much. And if it's anything more serious than that, you can speak to them directly and they will advise you and you can potentially even send it back to them and say, can you sort this out? And they will, no problem at all, without question. Whereas a, a cheap knockoff, they're not going to do that. They're not interested. They've got the money. Thank you very much. I think I've had a lot of experience with cheap airbrushes. Well, I've got three cheap airbrushes. I don't have one expensive one. And they're all fine. And you're right. I accept the fact that they do clog up. I accept the fact that they're not as... Uh, the, the, the work that I can get out of them isn't as fine as others. But I accept that. Um, I don't get out to oh. air, do much airbrushing. And I, and I also just don't have the ability to spend that much money at once on something like that. When I went into airbrushing, I bought myself a cheap airbrush mm. with a with that came with a compressor, and it's still in the drawer. Mm. And it still works to a point. Not It's not great, but it works to a point. And funny enough, I was listening to this on another podcast not that long ago where they had this same conversation, and something that um, one of the guys said was, which I thought was really good, Buy that cheap airbrush if you want to. Bright, buy it because that's what you can afford. That's what you can buy. Not a problem. But having the back in the mind that it, it, there will be some things that it does and the way it behaves that you won't get with an expensive uh, or or more expensive item. Yeah. <clears throat> Plus, also worst case scenario um, is obviously you throw it away and doesn't it because it don't work. Mm-hmm. But more than likely, as long as you keep it clean and keep on top of it, the worst case scenario will be it will become your um it will become one of other airbrushes that you got that you use for um let's say um uh putting putting gloss coats on on your work because you because with with those sort of things you're going to use a more aggressive cleaner okay so you you're not bothered about what happens inside your airbrush because it's a cheap one and it's got one purpose one job not problem yeah 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 so there, there, you know, there is a bonus to it, um, but yeah, uh, it is. Um, it's one of those airbrushes are one of those things that, unfortunately, uh, a bit like the compressors. I know people that have bought the cheap, 
Chinese compressors, yeah. uh, and they run forever and a day, and they're great. I also know the people that have bought them and they've run for two weeks and, and died. And that's yeah, it. well, the, all the, the output of them isn't enough to even move the paint from one part of the airbrush to another. That's another one I've seen. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Um, but if you buy expense, if you buy some expense, you've got warranty. You've got the backup of a company. If you buy cheap, then you don't have those two things either, do you? So hmm. uh, I guess it all depends on on the person. So there's no, there is no one th- thing fits all, is there, with airbrushing? No. <laughs> everyone's going to be different. I would definitely say that, that someone needs some one-to-one lessons. Though, and that's that's sort of something I would be very happy to do. You know, someone come to me and said, I'd like to learn a hobby. Like I give them the time to sit down and go through the, the airbrushing side with them as much as I knew mm. uh, without ruining their, <laughs> their enjoyment. <laughs> it's, it's fun. I think that's an important thing to, to finish this sort of section with is that, um, like most things, you're going to do a bit of research. So you're going to bit, do a bit of research on the value of airbrushes and models and all that sort of stuff. But try and get yourself involved in some online groups. Yes. Or maybe a local club. Yes. Or something like that. If you if you haven't got a friend that's introducing you, go and meet some model makers and um, talk to model makers because most model makers, 99% of them, are more than happy to talk to you about model making. They're more than happy to give advice. They're more than happy to point you in the right direction yeah. as they see it. But they want to share the hobby too. But they enjoy it. Absolutely. They want to share the love. But be aware. Caution. There is a caution warning. With the um, advice... There's loads of YouTube videos out there, loads of uh, communities. Make sure you take on board lots of different types of advice. Do a bit of research yourself and then make a decision as to what fits within your budget yeah. or within your availability locally, etc. Buy yourself a kit. And I also would go so far to say, as especially now, the new Airfix starter kits that have been slightly redesigned that are coming out. Oh, yes. Now, people are going to think we've, <laughs> we've done this on purpose. We haven't. Because only, only recently <laughs> did we see the new starter kits that yeah. are coming out by Epic. I have only just realised that. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, the new starter kits look amazing and, and easy. Yeah, they, they, they really refined the starter kits. I mean, there are other products available. Don't get me wrong. This isn't an advert for Airfix yep. in any way, shape, or form. Nope. I have to take my hat off to them for the fact that they've looked at their entry-level kits, if you like, and said to themselves, how can we make that easier, more enjoyable, and take away some of the faff out of the kit to make sure that the person that bought it enjoys it, wants to continue with the hobby, and continue their journey. Uh, Hats off to them. Yeah, designed it for the younger audience too, and a much simpler build. So they showed us, didn't they? They showed the difference between the start set and a gift set. And the starter set had much much less parts, yeah. and a lot of the detail was molded into the parts. And but the more complicated kit, the gift sets had them all as separate parts, which is grand. It gives you a quicker satisfaction. It gives you that interest and that uh, that modelling orgasm that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we all like to get a quick orgasm in here and there. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right. I might I might leave that out. <laughs> I was just trying to think of the word for satisfaction. Other than- you, you can't really use self gratification because that's a slightly different podcast as well. But I think that's that's what they're going for, yeah. isn't it? And that's what really what I'm I'm interested in is the reason somebody wants to sit and do some modelling is because they want to enjoy it and they want to have some fun and they want to have something at the end of it to show off. If you've bought the biggest kit, the biggest, the hardest kit with a thousand parts in it, you're not going to get that quickly and you get bored and just throw it away, which people do. So start small, start easy. I have a look at the start kits from FX, the new ones that are coming out. Mm. But there are others, like the uh, Armour Fast. They make some really nice armour kits that are six, seven parts. Put them together, you get yourself a little 177 tank. Done. There's your gratification right there. Rubicon. Rubicon models. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say they're starter kits per se, but the, the way they go to cover, the detail, etc. you've got... Um, and you and you don't have to go for the the tiger with a full interior, blah blah blah. You can go for something a little smaller and a little bit easier, but they're of a, a manageable size, and they're also something in which you potentially put together really quickly. Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. And that's part of what you want. Yep. Is you want to be able to have a relatively fast turnover of your models to start with before you start going down the road of having more complicated ones, because um, you want that plastification. We're going to call it now. 
plastification, the satisfaction of making plastic, you, you need that quite often. And once you've got that ball rolling, then you can start looking at the more complicated kits, the, the bigger kits, the things that take you a couple of weeks, a couple of months, blah, 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 yeah. depending on what time you've got available. Yeah. So, yeah, bear that all in mind that, you know, it's it's um, it's really important that you enjoy the journey and you get that plastification. Have you ever seen people who want to start the hobby just go and grab the biggest kit off shelf? Or go and buy something for somebody as a gift, as you know, the one massive kit. The new modeler starts it and just gets frustrated. Have you seen that before? Often. Yeah. Very often. Yeah. Who's guilty of that most are parents. Mm. They'll, I've been advised that you this hobby is for you, so I've bought you this 172nd Titanic <laughs> with LED lighting and um, <laughs> separate periscope and God knows what else. You know, all singing, all dancing. Yeah, it'll take you two years. There you go. You can knock that out this afternoon. And of course, they don't. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you see a kit that you love, you know, let's say the Lancaster from Border Models, and you've got a spare 500 quid, buy it. If that's what you want to do, buy it. Not a problem. But for Christ's sake, don't start building that as your first model. Put it on a shelf and say, I'm going to work myself to that model, you know, and go and buy yourself an easy put together starter kit. Well, that's exactly what I did 10 years ago or so when I, when I got back into the hobby. I watched a video of, uh, I've forgotten his name now, John, I think it is, building the 144th scale Final Molds Millennium Falcon. Mm. And I said, I want to build one of those. But I didn't just go and buy that kit because it was expensive. But I didn't just go buy the kit straight away. I went and got other kits first and built my, my skills and my, my tool set up. Mm. And then I built it rather than jumping in at a deep end. It just would have ruined it. Yeah, absolutely. And it would have looked half as good as I wanted it to. It had to be a, it's, and it's still on my shelf. I'm still very happy with it now. There will come a point in your journey, though, that you'll look at it and go, I could have done so much better. Um, Like I've always said, and I will always maintain, if you, if you are in a position to build your first model and then mount it on a, on a picture frame and put it up on a wall and say, that's my first model, then you should do so. Because, yes, your abilities will change over the years, but at least you've got the ability to look back and go, I did that. I can do this now. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I could mount that on the wall because it is a picture frame. The Millennium Falcon's stuck on the back of a Star Destroyer, and the picture frame is the back of the Star Destroyer. Well, it's not the very first model I made, but it's the very first model that I wanted to. It's a shame, really, when I started this journey that I didn't do exactly that, is to pick up a 172nd kit of, say, a Spitfire and go, right, blah, 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 that's it, that's my one, put it up, and then every five years build the same kit and see how my journey would have progressed. I wouldn't be able to afford to buy that. No, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm talking about a, a, a little, uh, it would have been a matchbox kit when I first started model making. Um, and, you know, it would have been my pocket money. So I buy that oh, kit, I see what it, you put mean. it on the wall, yes. and then a year later, two years later, five years later, whatever, decided, period, and then get that same kit again, build it, put it on mm. the wall next to it, and it would, be re- it would be really interesting to see the differences in gotcha. that journey because I bet you any money it'd be a little bit like that. Um, I can't think of the artist. You're gonna, I know you're going to jump in now with the, the name. But you know the, the, the picture of a face that's in different colours and different ways. Do you know what I mean? In squares. Oh, uh, the print artist, Andy Warhol. <laughs> yeah, pop art, that sort of thing. But you'd look at your Spitfires and you could definitely see a distinct difference between each one over that journey. And it'd be quite interesting, wouldn't it? What's your oldest kit that you have? I have got kits upstairs uh, packed away that are from my very first modelling part of my journey. Well, there you go. But I don't have the kit. You can't get hold of the kits anymore. You can. Of course you can. Uh, Well, I have. I've I've done that with the um, M8, didn't I? The tank that I did. Yeah. Yeah. It was just my very first tank I ever built, and I, I recently bought an, uh, the same kit and redid it. Yeah. And it is quite it is quite interesting to see that when I was young with no inhibitions or worrying about what people might think or say, there are some elements of it that are like, wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like the mud, for example, was um, – I think the mud, as I remember, was um, plaster right. of Paris with dirt out of my garden. <laughs> well, yeah, mud. What else is there? So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting to part of the journey. Whatever that uh, excitement is, though, that, that starts you buying that ma- massive model kit, whatever that spark is, that spark shouldn't be quashed 
<laughs> that spark should stop. That should be encouraged and, and built on. Mm. Whatever it is you want, they want to build, they want to just want to complete something and have it done. And I guess that's the that's the key, isn't it? Or plastification. Plastification. Yeah. If your dream is to build the Border Models Lancaster, that's four five hundred pounds, and you really want to make a really good job of it, and you can afford to do so, go and buy it. Nothing stopping you buying it and putting it on the shelf. Or buy it, give it to me. I'll show you how to do it, and then. <laughs> buy two give one to me and i'll show you and you can follow me as we go along <laughs> yeah we'll do it's a bloody build <laughs> don't ruin it for yourself don't do what is the biggest mistake is just by jumping in both feet and going well i don't understand why i can't swim one of the really good things that i did when i was starting out as a beginner was went i went to a, a model show i went to salisbury model show in the uk eight years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was now. Uh, in fact, it's coming up in a few weeks again. Mm. Um, and just going around there and seeing the different types of models that are available to the hobbyists was a massive eye opener. And that really excited me about the hobby. Mm-hmm. You know, all sorts of different sci-fi stuff that you, I'd never seen. It's the first time I've ever seen Machining Krieger, for instance. You know, it was beyond airfix. <laughs> And there's different scales that were available and the level of skill that people had. That was a real eye-opener, seeing things in the flesh. And I, and I wanted to have more of that. I, want, I wanted it all. Um, and I'm really glad that I went to that show because I don't think I would have been you know, interested. I'd still be doing other hobbies. Yeah, I think it's really important to get to shows as a beginner because of that experience that I had. Being part of the community, getting involved with that is really important because... Obviously, the hobby can be quite solitary. And don't get me wrong, it's great to be able to come in, in into your little hobby room, pick out a model and, and sit for hours on them by yourself, um, mulling away your time. It's also good to spend some time with other modelers because hey, you pick up tips and tricks more than anything else rather than if you sit in a room by yourself. So what you want to do is you want to have the ability to enjoy your plastic journey and maybe introduce a mate and say, look, I want to start this journey. Do you want to start it with me? You know? Yeah. There's nothing nothing wrong with nice. two, two newbies learning off each other. Um, could be fun. The problem by isolating yourself is is that when you get frustrated, when you, when, you, when you get annoyed at something that's going wrong, you haven't got someone to bounce that off and go, why is that doing that? I don't understand why that's doing that. Yeah. And, then you, and then if you are an inquisitive sort of person, you might spend three or four days on the internet trying to figure it out, by which time you've moved, tried to move on with your build. And you've made several mistakes instead of just one. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes, is there? That's the other thing. That's how we learn. No, absolutely. Don't be scared to make mistakes because one thing you're guaranteed in this hobby is you're going to make a mistake. But you will learn from it. Every single time you will learn from it. The thing I've seen beginners do a lot is uh, be worried about the mistakes and be afraid of, of sharing their stuff because they've made a mistake and or they or they perceive they've made a mistake and are worried of what people will say. I think you should celebrate your mistakes and say, look at the mess I made of this. Da da. And here's it from another angle. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Share 10 pictures of the, the, your mistake. Don't be afraid to learn from it. And try not to make that same mistake again. We do. We still make the same mistakes as we go along. But Oh, yeah. The resolution to that mistake is quicker because you've learned from last time. Well, that's what I tend to find. I sometimes quite often make mistakes repeatedly and go, oh, you idiot, should I be doing it this yeah, way? Yeah, yeah. But I know the answer as to how to fix it. So, yeah, yeah. That's that's the key. Is you make a mistake, you find the reason the reason for the mistake and how to fix it, and you either don't repeat it or when you do repeat, you go, "Oh yeah, I must remember not to put my fingers in the glue." <laughs> I'm the same. I'm the same. I've got loads of habits that I shouldn't do in model making that just don't don't work. I wish they did work. Like I always try and use full white and full black mm-hmm. all the time. And people tell you not to do it, and I do it, and it makes my models not look as good. But that's going to be in another episode. Episodes we're going to do common mistakes. Yep, we will write that down. I'm going to. In fact, I'm doing it right now. Speaking of mistakes, it's one of the things we do on the podcast, isn't it? We do th- we say things and we forget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the time. So a gentle, gentle approach is needed. Harness the new model's interest in a particular vehicle or era and help them build something small to get that buzz. Allow them to build up their skills slowly with encouragement all the way. 
Soon your new modelling friend will be all over social media, visiting the local hobby shops and searching out the latest deals on kits with you. You may even have a new hobby show buddy who is looking to help others in the hobby as well. Next time, we'll be just making conversation about opening a can of worms. Ooh. <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool beans. Okay, okay. You have been listening to Just Making Conversation with James Giffins and Malcolm Childs. Follow us on Facebook where we post photos, updates and other nonsense. Find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, Google Podcasts, The Bin and all the others. <laughs> Let us know what you are just making and your thoughts on the conversation in this episode. Thank you to the following supporters from buymeacoffee.com forward slash JMC podcast. Julian, Chuck, Tim, Mark, Bakawi, Simon the Jersey Gent, Steve, Lee, Costas, Mark, Ray, Neil, Mike, Robert, Andrew, Drew, John, Mike, Jeff, Richard, Lynn, Gordon, and six others. I love this way you say Bakawi. It sounds like a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> It is very much a case of putting your two pieces together, which personally I, I quite like because you have a little bit more control over it as to where you're putting it. You don't worry about that blocking up. How do you get it to not block? Do you leave yours laying down on its side or do you leave it sticking up in the sticking air? Sticking up in the air. It's, it's just a very thin tube. You tend to find with where you're using it over a period of time of use that will become solid, which your finger and thumb can pull, pull that off. It's right. easy peasy. Yeah, yeah, and then take it back out, and you yeah. make sure you clean that, clean the your end, so to speak, when you when you're finished. Don't go down the the road of using super glue and all that sort of thing. Hurt yourself. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't worry too much about the ins and outs of it. I would just go with what's locally available to you. Okay. Well, as long as you know how to use it, and the, because the technique for using it isn't written on the side of it.